Good evening, everyone. We warmly welcome you to yet another thought-provoking legal discussion on crime and law as a part of the phase two of Law is Light at the Pro Bono Committee of Law Students Association, Sri Lanka. We are honored to have with us today, Mr. Nalinda Indirissa as the speaker of today's discussion. He's a President's Counsel, a well-experienced practicing criminal lawyer and an advisor to the Colombo School of Business and Management. You can ask your question as we are streaming live on Facebook. We are hoping to answer them at the end of this discussion. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, this, this program basically caters to educate the public and to simplify the law. So we could, uh, could we begin with explaining what a crime is to the audience? Yes. Uh, the crime is generally known as uh, offense committed against the entire society. Now, this definition uh, has to be compared with what is a civil wrong. Now, in law, there is what is called criminal law as well as civil law. Of course, there are various other branches that to uh, delve more into it. But a civil wrong is a wrong done against a person. Uh, it is not a wrong done against the entire society. But crime takes the nature of an offense committed against the entire society. The public tranquility of the society, then um, the social order is disturbed. When a person disturbs the social order, accepted the manner of behavior, that, is, that constitutes a crime. Now, the distinction between a civil wrong and a crime means in a civil wrong, you go to a court, a person, the, so, the state does not take the responsibility of prosecuting and getting redress for the person who does a civil wrong. The party concerned will have to uh, pursue the matter in a civil court and get remedy. But in, in respect of a crime, it is not so. The society takes upon themselves, the government or the state takes upon itself the responsibility of uh, punishing the person for doing a wrong or um, making, trying to make amends or may recompensate the person who has been penalized, if it's a small, uh, it's a, it's a small crime. Uh, so it differs. The, the crime means basically generally can be uh, said to be an offense committed against the state as opposed to a civil wrong. So that is the definition of a crime, basic definition of a crime. Thank you, sir. Could we elaborate on the types of crimes? Say, for example, strict liability crimes, petty crimes. If you could explain the yeah. types of crimes. There are different uh, schools of thought about uh, uh, types of crime, but the basically accepted uh, diff uh, school of thought is that crime can be divided into personal crimes, property crimes, incoherent crimes, statutory crimes, and financial crimes. Uh, personal crimes are things like uh, assault of a person. Only basically you can say only one party is affected by that. But of course, still it is considered a crime because the society also looks down upon such activity. Then kidnapping of a person, uh, or a domestic violence where only people living in that household would be affected. Such a thing is 
called the personal crime. Then you get uh, property crime. Property crime, a little more serious in nature. Uh, that is, uh, say, somebody writes a forged deed for a property owned by another person. So forgery of a deed or even forgery of a document. Clay, I mean, rep to represent that the document has been issued by a person, whereas it has not been to permit forgery, a certificate uh, or theft. Now, theft also, you can say it's, uh, only one party is affected, but the society looks down upon such activity because everybody is, uh, there is a kind of psychosis that is created by permitting theft to take place. Then uh, things like robbery, more serious ones, extortion, that kind of things are property crimes. Then you get the statutory crimes, statutory crimes. Uh, these are not orthodox uh, crimes, but then uh, you get uh, with the development of uh, chemistry and development of society, uh, you have the downside of the development as well. You get drugs, drug-related crimes under the Poisons, Opiums and Dangerous Drugs Act, possession of certain chemicals, substances, which were not uh, known to the society prior to development that took place. So those possession alone is considered a crime. Those crimes are affecting the entire fabric of the society because uh, possession of drug, trafficking of drug could affect a larger group than, than a personal crime where assault only one person. But distribution of drugs, trafficking of drugs, possession, all that could affect a larger group. Then you get alcohol-related offences, drunken driving, uh, then brewing illicit liquor, that also has an impact on a large group of society. So those are possession of illicit liquor, uh, manufacturing of illicit liquor, uh, are things, they are statutory crimes. Then you, you have other offences like traffic accidents under the Motor Traffic Act, uh, those are those are statutory crimes. Where yeah, the statute creates the crime. Of course, the other crimes also have been created by statute, but those are those are those have been created long years ago under the penal code. But these crimes have been introduced as and when the situation arises. Now, when the drug traffic drug trafficking has improved, certain offenses are introduced. When different types of drugs come into the uh, society, those drugs are introduced into the legislation. So those are statutorily created crimes. Then you get the financial crimes, also, uh, also, uh, uh, also something that is uh, expanding day by day. Earlier, we started under the penal code. There were certain financial crimes like uh, criminal breach of trust. When a person is entrusted with property, he misappropriates the property or he commits, uh, uh, he, he uses that property in violation of the entrustment. That becomes criminal breach of trust. That's a financial crime because it involves, involves movable property. Then you get this criminal misappropriation, also a cognate offence of criminal, uh, the, uh, the criminal breach of trust is a cognate offence of criminal misappropriation. Then you get offences like cheating, where you make a representation and get somebody to deliver some property. So cheating is also financial crime. Those are the olden day financial crimes. But with the development of uh, the society, international trade, yeah, the, 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 the 
If the crime crime has become transnational, it's, it doesn't have limit to borders now. So then uh, things like uh, terrorist financing, the group, one group in Sri Lanka would finance a terrorist group in India or vice versa, or some things like money laundering, where people commit some offense of bribery or corruption or exchange control violation, and then their ill-gotten money is invested in the financial system of a different country. So things like money laundering, then computer crime, where through through uh, uh, through through computer using computer as a mode you commit the financial crime you enter into the database of a bank or database of a particular customer and give a command to transfer some money into a different account or you intercept uh, two parties who are doing international trade and send out a message as if the buyer is sending a message or seller is sending a message, remit money into this account. So that kind of computer crime, that kind of crime is financial crime. Then you get incoherent crimes, that is aiding and abetting of any of the principal offenses or conspiracy to commit any of the principal offenses. Uh, then also attempt to commit offenses. Those are incoherent crimes. So you get personal crimes which I explained, property crimes, statutory crimes, financial crimes, and incoherent crimes. There are five types of crime, but of course different schools think differently and some other schools think there are more, this can be uh, separated into more, more categories of crime, but these are the basically five types of crime. So if I may ask a follow-up question on that. So basically criminal law ensures the progress of society, is it? That to, is what, to ensure that... Yes, that is what criminal law seeks to achieve. Uh, of course, uh, certain, in certain respects, in certain jurisdictions, it has failed because the criminals of the present day are much smarter than the law enforcement authorities and law enforcement agencies. Uh, it is actually what the criminal law seeks to achieve is to safeguard the world or the society uh, from offenders and punish them and act as a deterrent so that it acts as a deterrent. Uh, so could you walk us through the process of how an arrest can be made, whether with the warrant, without a warrant? Yes. Now, can you? one thing, one thing, when an offense is made known to the society or somebody discovers that an offense has been committed, the usual thing that we do is we go to the police because police are the most commonest form of peace officers that we know of. Now, you would wonder what a peace officer is. It's a, it's a word for legally recognized law enforcement officer. Police is the commonest form of peace officers in Sri Lanka, but there are other kinds of peace officers. I may touch upon that also. You go and now later, but first you go to a police station and make a complaint. That's a basic way of approaching a crime. Then once you make a complaint, the police officer will want to, will analyze the material available 
it has been put down in layman's terms and see whether the a case where a reasonable suspicion of a person having committed an offence is made out. So once there is a reasonable suspicion, a police officer will have to look at whether the offence that has been revealed is a Offence that can, where a person can be arrested without a warrant. Now, basically, a person can be arrested without a warrant in more serious offences. For the reason, the when the offence is grave, there is no time for the police officer to go to the magistrate and get a warrant and come and arrest because the damage that would be caused to the society is great. So the law has recognized what are the, what the serious offenses are that is contained in schedule uh, in Schedule 1 of the Code of Criminal Procedure Act, if you look at the Code of Criminal Procedure Act, uh, column 3 of the Schedule 1 sets out the offences which are uh, offense, cognizable offences. Cognizable means offences in respect of which a warrant is not required to arrest a person. So, the Column 3 sets out the cognizable offences and the non cognizable offences. So then, if you take penal code offences, the police officer has to check whether a particular offence is an offence where he can arrest a person, cause an arrest without having to get an order from the magistrate. If, if he can arrest, if it's a criminal offence, he can go and arrest the person. If it is not a criminal offence, he has to report facts to the magistrate. Perhaps the magistrate will insist upon him to lead some evidence to satisfy him that there is a reason to give a warrant of arrest. Once that happens, in terms of the criminal procedure code, a warrant will be issued. He can go and arrest the person with the warrant. So there are two ways of causing arrest. If it's a cognizable offence, you can arrest the person without a warrant and thereafter produce the person before court. If it is not a cognizable offence, you have to go to the magistrate report facts, satisfy the magistrate, get a warrant and come and arrest. And in, in, in reference to this, I also like to draw all these law students their attention to section 32 of the Code of Criminal Procedure Act, where which, which speaks of uh, offences where a person can be arrested by a peace officer without a warrant. Not only in the case of penizable offences, there are other cases, other instances that have been set out in that section 32. Things like having in possession housebreaking implements, uh, or if a police officer sees, sees a proclaimed offender, he can be arrested without a warrant. Then also, if a police officer feels that a particular person is trying to escape and evade justice, that person can be arrested. An army deserter, navy deserter, air force deserter can be arrested without a warrant because you don't have time to go before a magistrate then. By the time you come with a warrant, the person would be gone. That is the idea behind it. And uh, also, a person 
taking precautions to conceal himself in order to commit an offence. Not a person who has committed an offence. In order to commit an offence, if you feel that people, some people are, uh, uh, you know, uh, equipping themselves to commit an offence, making preparations, also they can be arrested without warrant. Otherwise, you will have to go before uh, the magistrate and get a warrant. But speaking of the first schedule, paragraph, uh, column three, there are two 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 things that I had mentioned. That column three refers to penal court offences. First, first it refers to penal court offences, and in respect of penal court offences, all the offences have been listed out on the different sections, and they, it speaks what offences are cognizable and what offences are not cognizable. But in respect of other offences created by other statutes, now you see, penal court was the old criminal law. From, from time to time, I told you, as and when situations arose, new legislation has come in. Poison, Sobium, and Dangerous Act, Bribery Act. Now, if you see, look at the penal court, there was a bribery provision in the penal court also. But when they feel the situation is such, it cannot be caught up under the bribery provision in the penal court, they bring in the bribery act. When they feel that uh, uh, situation cannot be caught up under the provision which deals with uh, hazardous substances in the penal court, they bring the Opium Act, Poisons Opium. See, so, under those statutes, under those statutes, if the sentence is less than three years, all those offences are non cognizable offences, where you can't arrest without a warrant. But if the sentence in respect of those, in those statutes, the sentence is more than three years, all those offences become cognizable offences. Without a warrant, you can arrest. I suppose that is that explains the question. Absolutely, sir. Um, sir, now there's a general understanding that only police can perform an arrest. Other than the police, who can arrest a person? Yeah, there are the most commonest form of peace officer is a policeman. Now, uh, who is a police officer is contained in the Code of Criminal Procedure Act, Section 3. Two, section 2 uh, says who a police officer is. But there are people other than the police, policeman in khaki uniform, the grammar savers of the good olden day, <coughs> they were given police powers. They were given police powers in their appointment. So those grammar seekers who have police powers can cause an arrest. Other than that, you get wildlife officers under the wildlife ordinance who perform police duties. They can cause an arrest. Then uh, under the uh, under the what are the other statutes that uh, customs ordinance. There are uh, customs officers, forest ordinance, there are forest officers and under the Food Act, the PHIs, public health inspectors, they are people who could arrest. So they are also peace, termed as peace officers. Then under, under the under the amendment to the Code of Criminal Procedure Act, which are brought in in 1988, Act number 12 of 1988, made assistant government agents, if their letter of appointment has given them powers to act as peace officers, they could also cause an arrest. But we rarely see AGAs causing arrest. But if they have a letter of appointment has permitted them to arrest, 
they also can cause hemorrhage. So okay, sir. Here, please, officers. Okay, so thank you, sir. Um, so do does the person arresting have to mention reasons for the arrest being made? Well, uh, when you cause an arrest, you have to do it in terms of the provisions of the Constitution and the Code of Criminal Procedure Act. Now, if you look at Article 31 of the Constitution, a person should not be deprived of liberty except according to the procedure established by law. So, and he, when a person is arrested, he has to be told of the reasons for his arrest. Now, this, this provision, Article 31, is contained in the Fundamental Rights Chapter of the Constitution. So, it is a fundamental right that a person causing an arrest has to tell the reasons for the arrest. In addition to that, uh, in the Section 23, in Section 23 of the Code of Criminal Procedure Act also, unless a person submits himself to the law of peace officer, unless the person submits himself to the peace officer, he has to he has to be arrested by touching his body. If a person submits, you don't have to even touch the body. But if he doesn't submit, you have to touch the body uh, and cause the arrest. And he has to be told of the reasons for the arrest. But there are persons who, who sometimes when an arrest is caused, they try to avoid the arrest or they try to prevent the arrest, prevent the police officer from causing them. At that point, you can even use minimum force to cause the arrest. And it is minimum force, nothing more than that. So, to get, get back to your question, yes, you have to tell the reason for the arrest. So, you mentioned minimum force. Could you elaborate, maybe give examples to the general public as what, what can minimum force be? Minimum force is uh, the, so much of force that is sufficient to bring him under arrest. That is, uh, once he's arrested, you can't assault the person. Because then you, are, you have arrested him. Uh, minimum force, now if a person tries to assault a peace officer, then to prevent the assault, you can use force. But, uh, but you can use more force than what is reasonably necessary. So, in, in different circumstances, the amount of force that can be used is different. Now, if a person tries to avoid the arrest without any weapons in his possession, the minimum force would be force sufficient to put him under arrest and keep him under control. But if that person has a weapon in his hand and tries to use the weapon, the minimum force would be to take the weapon off his hands. It can be force sufficient to take the weapon off his hands. So it's, it's reasonable force in the circumstances. You can't, you can't exhaustively say minimum force is this. It all depends on the circumstances of the case and the amount of uh, resistance that a person uses to avoid the arrest. Um, so now when a person is investigated, is it necessary that a lawyer should be present during such investigation? Well, uh, 
necessity and rights are two different things. Of course, lawyers will want to be present in an investigation takes place. Lawyers would like to be present. And of course, uh, they have certain rights. If you look at Section 41 of the Judicature Act, Section 41 of the Judicature Act, it says uh, uh, a person has the right to represent his client at any in, a, in any court of law or any institution that has been established for the administration of justice. It reads this way. Every attorney at law, I'm reading 41 subsection 1, every attorney at law shall be entitled to assist and advise clients to appear, plead, or act in every court. Assist and advise. Assist means you can be present also. Uh, or other inst uh, in every court or other institution. I emphasize the word other institution. No, it doesn't limit it to court. The attorney at law has the right to represent his client in other institutions established by law for the administration of justice. Now, police stations have been established by law for the administration of justice. So, and every person who is party to or has or claims to have the right to be heard in any proceeding in any such court or other such institution shall be entitled to be represented by an attorney at law. So this is a right that has been given by the Judicature Act. Judicature Act. But if you look, look at, look at uh, the constitutional provision, uh, there is a slight change. Now if you look at uh, uh, Article 13.3, of the Constitution, every person who is uh, charged before a court of law, charged, I emphasize the word charged here, as, has a right to be represented by an attorney at law. Now, charged means when a formal plaint has been filed, a charge sheet has been filed, when you are you are in the status of an accused. But anything prior to the filing of the charge is that when you are a suspect. So, Constitution has given us the right, given the accused the right to be represented in a court of law when he is an accused, not when he is a suspect. But, although it is so, in every court, when at, when he is a suspect, also the lawyers appear. Lawyers appear. So they use this provision that is at section 41, subsection 1 of the Judicature Act to, uh, to uh, establish their right to representation to represent the person. And uh, in regard to this, I think the Inspector General of Police has made a Gazette notification acting under Section 55 of the Police Ordinance. The Inspector General, by his Gazette notification, Gazette Extra Ordinary Notification, bearing number 1758-36, stroke dated 18 May 2012, has uh, given some guidelines where the police officers have to help and be very cordial with the attorneys at law who come to their stations to represent their clients. So they have a right to be represented both in court as well as before other institutions by an attorney at law.
but i would uh, practically what i have seen is when a suspect gives his statement to a police officer attorney at law will not be able to assist him they won't permit him to be assisted by a lawyer because then the statement of the suspect would be uh, made according to the advice that the client receives from the accused uh, from the lawyer so at the time he is interrogated and his statement is recorded in sri lanka there is no right of assistance from a lawyer but i would say in certain other countries when client is interrogated and his statement is being recorded there is right of representation but in those countries statement made to the police is admissible before a court of law whereas in our country whatever you say in the statement admitting guilt confession confessionally or hinting guilt is not admissible against the accused so he has he has a right of representation up to a particular point but not at the time he when, when he makes a statement accused but complainant has a right to be throughout to be represented by an attorney at law so what is the duty owed by the police to person held under the custody well uh, there are certain duties cast on them under the fundamental rights chapter that is uh, they now article 11 if you look at they should not be subjected to cruel inhuman and degrading treatment there is there is there was a lot of complaints about suspects when in police custody are being subjected to cruel inhuman and degrading treatment so many police officers have been taken to the supreme court by in the uh, by way of fundamental rights applications and found guilty then they are they have had to catch but uh, they have had to face charges under the cruelty act also because they over duty not to inflict bodily or mental harm to a suspect and they have to be uh dealt with humanely you can use all your investigating tactics you can use all your investigation skills you can use all your investigation techniques to interrogate the person you don't have to touch his body the the techniques are so advanced now without uh, without uh, harming the person causing bodily harm or putting him through a lot of mental stress you can interrogate a person because when when some something happens a I mean, incident happens there will be so many witnesses now if we says if if the suspect takes up an alibi that he was living on the particular day when the incident happened at this particular time i was in jaffna there will be enough material to uh, support this case so you only have to investigate whether in fact he was in jaffna say for instance now if somebody falsely takes up the position that he was in jaffna whereas he was actually in that vicinity where the incident took place in kalambo he takes up a false position it is up to the police you don't have to hit him and say no you were in kalambo we have cctv footage we have already all these recordings admit it and saying all that you don't have to beat him you have to treat him very well 
because you can demonstrate at all about the time by you through CCTV recordings, his tower, telephone tower details. A lot of technology can be used. Various other witnesses, testimony. You can establish the position that is taking up is false. So you why if you can establish it without any problem, why must you harass him? There is no need. So there is a duty on the police to deal with the suspects in a very human way and that is a duty cast on them by Article 11 of the Constitution. That's a fundamental right of the, uh, of the suspect. So, the moment that is breached, the investigator could fall into trouble. Um, so, Article 13.5 of the Constitution speaks of presumption, of presumption of innocence, but the general public tend to brand a person to be guilty the moment something hits the news. Can you explain how that how the law looks at it? Well, uh, there is this 13.5 has presumption of innocence. That is uh, in a criminal court of law criminal court of law, until a person is proved guilty, he is presumed to be innocent. How do you prove that a person is guilty? The prosecution will have to prove, establish that the accused is guilty. What is the standard of proof? Beyond reasonable doubt. So when the, it is, the, the presumption of innocence contained in Article 13, sub Article 5 of the Constitution is a rebuttable presumption, will be rebutted only upon the prosecution establishing beyond reasonable doubt that the accused is guilty of the offence that is charged with. Now, this beyond reasonable doubt is not beyond any doubt. There could be doubts, but it has to be a reasonable doubt. It has to be a reasonable doubt, not beyond any doubt. Beyond, it's a reasonable doubt. Today, what happens is uh, media also. Now, before a trial is taken up, there are a lot of media. Coverage. A lot of uh, social media, the print media, the electronic media, everything is there. So they go to town about the matter. They in interrogate witnesses. Uh, they don't pro permit the cross examination of the witnesses. They interrogate witnesses and put forward a theory before the case is concluded. They superficially put up put forward a theory. They won't go delve into the very core of the credibility of the witness. Because the antiques that take place in a court of law, like permitting a lawyer or a senior lawyer to cross-examine a witness, permitting a particular witness who claims that he saw the incident to be tested with his own statement given at the time of the incident. To test this consistently between the present testimony and the previous testimony. And test the credibility of a particular witness as opposed to another witness who claims that he also saw the incident. All that is not available to the press. They will only take a statement of one witness and go to town with it. They crucify the person. They sometimes convict the person, crucify the person, and then expect the judges also to convict that person just because the social media or the media did it. But in court, that doesn't happen. 
Yeah, there is a, a people who keep themselves away from what happens in the media. They will analyze the evidence that has been placed before them, whether the version is from. There are several uh, methods of analyzing evidence. Test of consistency, whether you have been consistent throughout, whether you have said the same thing in the police station, and your testimony today is in line with what you have told, with the, told the police. Uh, consistency between witnesses, then test of prob inherent probability of version. All that is taken into account by a court of law. So, a lot of, uh, lot of uh, evaluation takes place in a court of law. Sometimes, when there is no evidence, The court decides to acquit, but whereas the media has convicted him, then they find fault with the court also sometimes, which should not be the case. If there is evidence, it must be presented properly. If it is not present, it has to be first investigated properly. If it has not been investigated, then if it has not been presented properly, you can't get justice. You can't, no point blaming the court. People who investigate, who take the matter to court, have to be diligent in their role. And if you don't play the material before court, court can't do anything. So you can't, you can't pass judgment on the court or on the system because a person gets acquitted. Maybe actually he's a person who deserves to be acquitted. So, what conviction before a court of law and a conviction by the press or the media are two different things. So, in a court of law, what is paramount is a case has to be proved, criminal case has to be proved beyond reasonable doubt. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the very detailed explanation of that. I think the public would understand this clearly now. Uh, we'll move into the question and answers engaging the public. We already got some questions because we circulated a Google form prior to the session where we uh, asked the public to submit their questions. And one of the questions was, what action can someone take against a stalker? Stalker? Yes. Uh, well, very little action that we can take against the stalker. Uh, very little action that we can talk against, take against, in law against even a person um, who publishes um, even defamatory articles. I must not say this in public also. About using... Uh, the computer because presenting evidence presenting evidence before a court of law is very difficult to, in those cases uh, sometimes if 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 the person who holds the facebook account or similar uh, social media account denies that this is my this is my, uh, my Facebook account. A civil litigant is unable to do anything because he doesn't have an investigating arm. But in criminal law, our Computer Crime Act is in an infant stage. It only, it only, uh, permits to take to task people who unlawfully or without authority intercept into other other people uh, information you i log in from my computer and intercept it to your computer using your password or hacking the computer then action can be taken 
But stock race is not a person who will intercept. He is a person who will observe you and you know make various comments about you. That kind of activity is generally permissible through the usage of computer. But if it goes beyond a certain level of tolerance, you can report it to the, the service provider and get him to do action. If it is defamatory, perhaps you might be able to fi file a defamation action, but that would be a long shot and very expensive shot. Uh, so, against a stalker, there is our law has not developed that much. Our Computer Crime Act is wholly inadequate to deal with present situation. That's why I started saying the criminals are far advanced than the investigating authorities. When uh, the criminal travels in a brand new BMW, the investigating authority he goes in a ramshackle uh, jeep. So they are much faster. In, in, in every respect, they are much faster. And are, so we have to move forward. We have to have smart investigators, smart uh, people, computer analysts, the, the accountants. Uh, we don't have that facility. So against stalkers, I don't think uh, we can do very much, except of course, we can lodge a complaint and perhaps get him down. And if he admits, it's all right. If he doesn't admit, if he says, this is not my Facebook account, how, we, how are they going to prove it? They have to go to the server, get the information, and prove that it is from this server. That will be a long shot, and the ordinary police officer will not be able to handle a situation like that. And every, if such complaints are entertained, all complaints are entertained, there will be so many complaints, and the police force will not be enough. So I think very little uh, legal assistance can be given, but one can try a police complaint. If he is lucky, he will admit and stop, stop. Okay, sir. And also, uh, another question is, does bullying amount to a criminal act? Cyberbullying. Or even physical bullying? Yes. Bullying, it all depends on what kind of bullying. You have to describe what the bullying is. Bullying can be a physical act. Now, see, say for instance, ragging. Ragging is kind of bullying. That is, that is, that, they, that is caught up under the anti-ragging act. Then uh, there is what is called uh, criminal intimidation under the penal code. Who told and they also that was there. Then um, um, there are few other offences which which can cover up a situation like that. So bullying, yes, definitely bullying is a good. Um, you know. uh, another question is: What is contempt of court, and is that a criminal offence? Of course, it is a criminal offence, and uh, I think the person who question, raised the question must read the judgment in Ranjan Ramanayaka case. It's a it's an offence committed against the system because uh, anybody anybody trying to interfere with the administration of justice will be constituting committing an offence of criminal contempt of court. Now, uh, if, if, if somebody speaks ill of judges with the, with the idea of getting judges to give judgments to his liking, that is also an interference with the administration of justice. 
a lot of long line of authorities on this and definitely it is a criminal offence it is why it is for that reason why the offenders are sent to jail if it is a civil wrong they will not be sent to jail uh there's another question so that asks uh what are the actions a person can take if the police does not follow the correct procedure example if the police does not accept a complaint if the police do not accept the complaint firstly you must you must have the complaint uh uh well well drafted uh, so that it makes out a crime now if if you go to the police station and make a complaint like uh, a thing like you know uh yeah which 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 this causes only a civil wrong say for instance uh, i had a agreement with the person i gave goods he paid a little bit of money but the balance he had not paid that kind of complaint this causes only a civil wrong because it's not a crime he had paid part of it balance he had not paid so if police can investigate only criminal complaints not civil complaints if a civil complaint is lodged then either they don't investigate there is nothing that you can do about it but if a criminal complaint is made and if they refuse to accept it you can firstly you can try and go to the to the complaint to the idp inspector general of police saying that this is my complaint i went to the police station they refused this is the officer who refused or you can go to the human rights commission or you can even go to the extent of going to the court of appeal by of a writ of mandamus writ application writ of mandamus so you can first try the administrative relief and see if any be with a complaint to the inspector general of police if he he generally responds and you might succeed and if you are not the complaint thank you sir i think we've almost i mean so there one more thing if you if you have not the complaint and if they are not taking action on it and they are very they are taking a very slow it, the investigation is taking a slow speed permitting the accused to uh, get out again you can go to the court of appeal and complain again you can go to the ipp and complain even you can go to the dit or the particular area and complain and they take, generally take action thank you sir now we we'll move on to the vote of thanks fara thank you zena um i would like to take this opportunity to thank our respectable panelists mr nalin p sir for sparing his valuable time of his busy schedule to enlighten and educate us by sharing his immense knowledge on the subjects of crime and law uh, it was a very fruitful session and we have definitely gained a lot also i would like to take this opportunity to thank our participants for being here with us throughout the session thank you and have a good night Good night.